And it just so happens that we're talking about how Jesus gives us rest today. Jesus gives us rest. We're in this teaching series titled Live Missionally. Live Missionally, we've seen the instructions of Jesus. And before we dive into the text, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 is where we're going to be in the beginning of chapter 12. If you're a first-time guest with us, welcome. Would you take that Connect card that you were handed on the way in and begin to fill it out? If you'd rather fill out a digital version, there is a QR code on the seat in front of you. Would you scan that QR code and you can fill out the digital the digital uh, version of that Connect card. And we just want to get to know you. We want to know how we can pray for you. And so that's the Connect card. Glad to have the Goddards back with us. The Goddards back, Pastor Mike, Sue, Kendall, and Caleb. For those that don't know who they're clapping for, that's our family pastor and his wonderful family. Uh, our church is so gracious. We have granted a uh, 10-week sabbatical uh, to rest, and to unplug. After 12 years, 12 faithful years of serving the Lord and serving this church. So glad to have my brother back here. And uh, it's been lonely at times. It's been lonely at times. But glad, glad he's back. Glad he's back. Jesus gives us Rest. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what the, the pressure that you are facing. Some of you are facing the decisions that are before you. I don't know the amount of work uh, that is surrounding you. I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know when the last time you paused and took a rest. But what we're going to see today clearly is that Jesus gives us rest. And here's the, here's the most comforting of it all. It's not a rest that just, you know, just kind of comes and goes. It's, it, it's a lasting rest. It's a real rest. Jesus gives us rest. Look to chapter 20, uh, 11, verse 25. Chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, at that time, Jesus said, if you have your Bibles open, you wonder, well, what time? At what time? If you look back to... Uh, the prior section of scripture, Jesus has just announced three towns. Last week, we referred to these three towns, Capernaum, Chorazim, and Bethsaida as the evangelical triangle. These three towns are situated in the, well, the ruins of these three towns are situated in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, right on the Sea of Galilee. That is Capernaum, and that is Bethsaida, and then just to the north is Chorazim, creating a triangle if you look at a map. Most of Jesus' earthly ministry, as we talked about, was centered around the Sea of Galilee. As we read through the Gospels, we see miracle after miracle. We see Jesus teaching with authority. We see Jesus instructing the disciples and then sending them out from town to town. And as you look back to the text from last week, you will see that Jesus denounces these three towns that, by the way, have witnessed, again, I remind you, witness the miracles of Jesus. Have witnessed the authoritative words of Jesus. I mean, have witnessed Jesus in person, in the flesh. But yet Jesus denounced them because they would not repent. They would not repent. And so the beginning of verse 25, we see that Jesus begins to pray. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have given these things from the wise, uh, have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure, all things that have been entrusted to me by my Father, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal Him. So what's happening here? What is, what is Jesus saying in this prayer to the Father? Well, Jesus, firstly, is praising those who do receive His message. He's denounced the ones that didn't receive it. Now he's praising God for those who are receiving his message. Uh, verse 25 reminds us that if we do respond to Jesus, it is because the Father, the Father, has revealed these things to infants like us. What does this really mean? Well, this means that it is Jesus 
and Jesus alone that gives us the knowledge that we have. We desperately need him. Not just a song, not just a moment of the worship gathering that we pause and consider our desperate need, but every day, every moment of the day, we desperately need the Lord our God to fill us up with the knowledge that we need to make it through the day and make the right decisions that are before us. We need to seek the Father to know his will and to have his knowledge imparted into us. I don't know what that looks like for you, but I want to encourage you this day to make it a practice of your life, your daily life, to get alone with the living God and ask him, fill you up with the knowledge that you need, the wisdom that you need. And reveal them to infants. That's a not so encouraging at times to be referred to as an infant, right? We all, we all uh, at least the majority of people that I speak with want to be, uh, you know, older than we really are. You know what I'm talking about? Older than we really are. Like, don't call me an infant. What are you talking about? Uh, I, don't, don't reduce me down here. I'm, I am more mature. I am more mature. And then, and then it's that one thing that we do that's like, ah, there went my maturity, you know? And so, and, uh, but, but, but Jesus calls out that the only way for maturity to take place in an infant like you and an infant like me is that he imparts that knowledge into us. Parse that knowledge into us. We see in verse 27, all things have been entrusted to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father. No one knows the son except the father. No one knows the father except the son and anyone to, to whom the son de desires to reveal him. There is a, an important difference in the way that the son knows the father and the way we know and the way we know him. We know God the Father because he makes himself known. Part of that spiritual discipline of getting alone with the Lord each day is just to encounter the Lord in all his glory. That he would make himself known to, to you. Uh, that's the, why the psalmist describes it this way. Have you heard this? Taste and see that the Lord is good. How could the psalm know it had he not encountered the Lord? But, but, but what a commitment. What a commitment for you and me to get alone with the Father each day and to taste and see that he is good. He is good. John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says this, I and the Father are, are one. There's a great confidence in the Godhead that the, the, the God had God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus describes the relationship here in this text as he prays to the Father. Look to verse 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me. We see in verses 28 through 30, Jesus' invitation. Do you see it with me? We see Jesus' invitation in verses 28, 29, and verse 30. His invitation for you and I to, to come. And Jesus showed his uh, authority when he says, come to me. When he says, come to me. This, by the way, at this time, in this moment, this invitation is unthinkable of anyone else but God. And it's also a caution to you and I today who call people to themselves instead of Jesus. We're living in a time where we want to build our name and build our fame, and we better be careful that we're building the name and fame of Jesus, that we're promoting Jesus, that we're drawing people to Jesus, that we're telling people about Jesus. Might I remind you, we began Matthew chapter 1 looking at the king and his kingdom. There's only one king, and it's not you, and it's not me. It's King Jesus and we exist for his glory and to promote his kingdom. One king living for the kingdom that will last. And this is what Jesus says, come to me all of you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, come. 
He drives none away. He calls them to himself. His favorite word is come, not go. To Jesus himself, we must come by a personal trust and to a personal relationship. Jesus invites us to come to him. Jesus invites us to come to him. Matthew chapter 19 is a description of uh, Jesus is, is resting. Ministry is hard and busy. And then Matthew chapter 19, we find that there's these parents that have brought their children to Jesus. Do you, do you know the story? And he brought, brings the, the parents are bringing them to Jesus and they're, they're met by the disciples. And the disciples are, are this like, you know, the, the armed guards. <laughs> and they're like, uh, no, you can't, you can't see Jesus at this time, right? <laughs> and, uh, I, I, you know, I, and so I was going to share an illustration and then I was like, no, I better not share that. So we're just going to keep going. And so these, these parents are, these parents are coming, they're coming to, to, to Jesus. I mean, it's Jesus, right? Can you imagine being met by the disciples that day? How discouraging that must've been for the parents. But then Jesus speaks these words, let the children come to me. Let the children come to me. A few weeks ago, we had a family dedication, baby dedication. And actually, we shared this, this account as a challenge to us as a church that we better be proactive, that we better believe in the younger generation, that we better not put walls up for the next generation to come to Jesus, to learn about Jesus, to know Jesus, to be fully devoted followers of Jesus as children. Now, oftentimes, we're waiting for, for, for adult status. We can wait no longer. Jesus says, come. He says, come. Verse 29. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart. And you will find what? Rest for your souls. You will find rest for your souls. Jesus says, take up my yoke. According to Adam Clark, the ancient Jews commonly used the idea of yoke to express obligations to God. They used a yoke to express obligations to, to God. There was a yoke of the kingdom. There was a yoke of the law, the yoke of the command, the yoke of repentance, the yoke of faith, and the general yoke of God. There's a whole lot of yokes going on here. And in this context, it's easy to see Jesus simply saying, forget about all the other yokes. What does he say? Take my yoke. Take my yoke. And learn from me. When training a new ox to plow, uh, ancient farmers often yoked it to an older, stronger, more experienced ox who bore the burden and guided the young animal through the learning process. And what does Jesus say? He says, take my yoke and learn from me. Take my yoke, Jesus says. Take my yoke. Learn from me. Because I am lowly, humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. This, this portion of Jesus' words, rest for your souls souls is an echo of Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16. In Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16, it's, a, it's an offer of God to the people of God. It's an offer of God to the, the people of God to follow his way, the ancient path. And now Jesus issues the same offer to, to, to come and to, to, to find rest, to follow his way. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 says this, this is what the Lord says. Stand by the roadways and look. Ask about the ancient paths. Which is the way to what is good? Then take it and find rest for yourselves. But they protested, we won't. The people of God had an invitation from God to come and to follow, to be obedient and to follow his path. And, and they refused. 
They refused. And the point is they're following Jesus' path. What's happening? They're, they're finding rest. They're finding rest. Uh, disaster always follows disobedience. You can read the rest of the account of the, the major prophet of Jeremiah and see that disaster indeed came as a result of the people of God not following God. God's like, here's the path. Follow me. And you'll find rest. And you'll experience peace. And, and then you consider, I guess we're quick to jump on, you know, the people of God back in Jeremiah's time. Why wouldn't they just choose, right? Why why would they choose disaster? Well, then you consider your life and the decisions you make. And when God says, follow me, be obedient to me, cling to me, live out my truth. And then we get all excited and frustrated and angry when disaster strikes. Disaster always follows disobedience. Look to verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Greek word for easy, it's an interesting word. It means well-fitting. It means well-fitting. Once again, for my yoke is well-fitting. My yoke is easy. In ancient Israel, ox yokes were made of of wood. Uh, Barclay says the yoke was carefully adjusted so that it would fit well and not gall the neck of the patient beast. The yoke was a tailor made was tailor made to fit the ox. Tailor made to fit the ox. Jesus says my burden is light. Do you see his words? My burden is light. This isn't a call to a lazy life. There is still a yoke to bear. There is still a burden to carry. But the encouragement, church, is that he bears it with us. That we don't bear it alone. He bears it with us. Born alone, it might be unbearable. Yet, with and in Jesus, they are easy and light. This is not a promise That there will never be troubles in our lifetime. Jesus said there will be troubles. But in the midst of the trouble, I'm going to give you a peace. I am always encouraged when I hear testimonies of people that have gone through significant trials and held on to their faith. And and then at the other side, they're able now to walk others that are going through that similar trial to, to encourage them, to comfort them. And somehow God takes all of our trials. He takes all the significant pains of this broken life and he is able to use it for his glory. Be encouraged today that you're not alone, that the Lord our God is present, that the Lord our God cares like no one else cares, that people will come and go, but there is one who remains. Our confidence, our confidence is in the living God, creator of heaven and earth, The one who loved humanity enough. Jesus would be sent to this earth. Would die on a cross. His blood would shed. He would be placed in that grave. And on the third day he would rise again victorious. So that you and I can cling to a living hope. And knowing that one day the greatest hope of all heaven awaits. Look to chapter 12, verse 1 with me. With all of this in mind, at that time, Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick and eat some heads of grain. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, see, Your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. 
All through the Gospels, we see this tension. All through the Gospels, we read about the, the friction between the religious leaders of the day and Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus was concerned about uh, people's uh, souls. The religious leaders of the day, it was all about the external. It's interesting as we read through the Gospels that it, it's almost as if the Pharisees are watching and they're waiting they're waiting for that moment. Oh, this, I'm watching when you slip up. How many people are watching and waiting? They're waiting for you. Watching and waiting for that very moment that you'll slip up. And on this day, verse 2 says, Pharisees saw this. Now, there was nothing wrong with what they did because their picking was not considered stealing. Maybe some of y'all thought, Oh, man, those disciples. Uh, they're getting in somebody else's grain field. It's not their grain field. <laughs> they're stealing. But according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, 25, Deuteronomy 23, 25, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't stealing. The law of Israel allowed people traveling through an area to pick enough grain for a small meal from fields in the area. Farmers were commanded to not completely harvest their crops but to leave a little behind for the sake of travelers and for the poor. The issue was only the day on which they did it. The text says it was the Sabbath day. Uh, the rabbis made an uh, elaborate list of do's and don't items for the Sabbath. And this violated several elaborate uh, uh, lists, uh, items on the list. Some Jewish people in Jesus' day recognized that the rules about the Sabbath were mostly human additions to the law. Mostly human additions to the law. They pick this grain. They're hungry. They eat it. Pharisees see it. And what do they shout out? See, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. I want to pause for just a moment, and I have a growing concern that is weighing heavy on my heart as a pastor and a, a, a leader in the Treasure Coast particularly, but, but I have a growing concern, church, that the church at large is developing proud, pious, pharisaical believers rather than humble, compassionate, fully devoted followers of Jesus. I have a growing concern. I have a growing concern. Now you might, you might say, oh, what, what about accountability? Oh, there should be accountability within the church. That's one of the beautiful things about being connected and committed to a local church is that one to another, we can see each other and lovingly come alongside of each other. But, but there's this growing concern within me and, and I believe it's coming from a cons very consumeristic place that I'm entitled to something. That it's like the church is becoming a, a country club and we better be careful. That's not what, I'm a member and so what do I get out of this thing? We don't see that in the scriptures. It's always what can I give? A couple years ago, Audra and I visited a church. For those that don't know, I have the privilege to serve as the director of Treasure Coast Baptist Association. There's 68 churches throughout the Treasure Coast, three counties. And, and so from time to time, I, I will preach uh, in, in one of these churches. Um, most weeks, I'm meeting with three or four pastors just to talk about you know, the, the pains of ministry, uh, the, the challenges to work, help them work through the challenges. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a privilege. A few years ago, Audrey and I visited a church. I was asked to preach. And, and so we come into the sanctuary and, and, and we find our seat and we're up closer to the front just so it's a little easier for me to walk up and preach. And, and I, I tell Audrey, I'm going to go use the restroom. And I come back from using the restroom and uh, Audrey's not there. I'm like, all right, where, where is she? <laughs> you know, I'm looking around, I'm looking around and I finally see her, you know, five, six rows back. And, and so I, I, I walk up to her. And I said, well, why'd you move? <laughs> and, uh, and she goes, well, when you were in the restroom, some lady came over to me and said, uh, I'm the oldest member of this church and you're sitting in my seat. I said, okay. Talk about being fired up to preach after an encounter like that. It was go time, man. It was, it, it was, it was go time. 
But this is the problem if we're not careful with the church of today. Where we're turning it all about me. Preacher, make me feel good about myself. Preacher, song leader, make me feel good about myself. We don't find that in the scriptures. I want to come and encounter the glory of God with my brothers and sisters. I want to see those that, that, are, that are one step away from the pits of hell experience the grace and mercy of Jesus and their lives be transformed forever. That's what I want to be a part of. That's what I'm committed to. Amen. These Pharisees were watching and they were waiting. They were waiting to call the disciples out and Jesus out. But look at the response of Jesus in verse 3. It's a deeply profound response in verses 3, 4, and 5. He said to them, Have, haven't you read what David did when he and those who were hungry with him, those who were with him were hungry? How he entered the house of God and they ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him or for those with him to eat, but only for the priests? Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath and are innocent? Jesus responds with these profound responses. Jesus reminded them that human need is more important than observing ceremonial rituals. I... Uh, I'm thankful that the first Sunday of each month we pause and consider at some point of the worship gathering the body and blood of our Savior Jesus. And each month you'll hear from a different elder. I've asked a different elder to come and to lead the church in taking of these elements. But, but what you won't find and this might be a deal breaker for some, but that's okay. Uh, what you won't find is this is how we're always going to do it. I mean, the elements remain the same. The message doesn't change. Jesus' body was crucified on a cross and his blood was really uh, shed for the forgiveness of sins. But, but sometimes we'll take it together. Sometimes we'll ask you to get along with the Lord. I, I mean, it, it might be different each time. Might even be a different scripture each time. And for those that were raised in a church like me, that, that can be hard at times. This is how it's supposed to be. Well, who, who said that? Just said, remember. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. Do this in remembrance of me. And so Jesus responds. He, he refers to David. Do you see that? 1 Samuel chapter 21. You can write that reference down. 1 Samuel chapter 21. The incident with David was a valid defense. Because it was a case of eating, it probably happened on the Sabbath. It, it concerned not only David, but his followers. So Jesus responds by mentioning 1 Samuel chapter 21. Then, as far as the temple, the temple ritual always involved work. The kindling of fires, the slaughter and preparation of animals, the lifting of them on the altar, and other responsibilities. According to uh, Numbers chapter 28, verse 9, Numbers 28, verse 9, this work was actually uh, doubled on the Sabbath because the offerings were doubled. So Jesus responds to these religious leaders of the day with, with Scripture. But then look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the temple is here. Jesus is referring to himself. Something greater. Why is that so significant? Because the people had to come uh, to this specific place to encounter the presence of God, to be forgiven of their sins. But Jesus is now saying, hey, I'm the mediator between uh, a man and God. I've come so people might be forgiven, so people might be set free. Something greater than the temple is here. Verse 7, if you had known what this means, I desire 
mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus quotes another scripture, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent. Verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Again, a place of authority. No one else would speak like this. But only the one who has authority would speak like this. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Since Jesus is greater than the temple, we should regard him as so. Don't get me wrong. I am thankful to God for this building and for this property. Those that have been with us on this journey for past 15 years. Some from the earliest of days, moving locations, five different locations. I'm thankful for this building. But at the end of the day, this is just a building. I'm thankful that we can use this building for the glory of God, and, and we are. What the Lord is doing Monday through Friday in this coffee shop is, I'm, in, I'm encouraged. It's incredible. Starting in a couple of weeks, there's a Christian dance studio that's going to, little girls are going to learn ballet to Christian songs. I'm thankful. The partnership we have with Recovery Church on, on, on Monday nights, I'm thankful people are coming and finding freedom. I'm thankful for the leadership that's here. And that's not just recovery and discovery, but truly we're together in this. I, I'm thankful. Church called me last week. They were ripped off by a GC. GC stole hundreds of thousands of dollars out west of town and they were supposed to be finished with this project, this remodel project. And they've been meeting under a pavilion. Hey, I don't know about you, but that AC feels really good right now. Uh, how many times we thank God for the AC, you know? But they've been meeting, they've been meeting all summer and they just called me and said, hey, like a couple people were about to pass out last week and we just don't know if we can meet another month or two months under this pavilion. I said, come on. Come on. We're, we're, we're out of here shortly. But I'm thankful. But, but at the end of the day, Jesus did not come and die for a building. The church is not a Landmark and address, 4441 South 25th Street. Hey, the church is me and you. Jesus closes his response again with this position of authority. He says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Bold statement, particularly to the religious leaders of that day, that would say, No, you better abide by the do's and don'ts. And Jesus said, I've come so people can find rest. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? All across this place, if, if you're online with us, would you do the same for a moment? I wonder what your response is today. I wonder how the Lord has spoken to you. Maybe it is that you're tired. You're at the end of yourself. But perhaps that's exactly where God wants you right here, right now for you to accept Jesus' invitation to come to him and to find rest. Maybe you're trying to do this thing on your own. And Jesus is saying, hey, take my yoke. I can't.
can't answer for you today. Maybe, maybe lately your response has been like the Pharisees. You've been, you've been busier calling people out than asking the Lord to examine your life. And right now, if you were honest and transparent, there's, there's no compassion. There's no compassion. There's no love. There's no grace. Perhaps you've forgotten that you were once lost. If you've been walking with Jesus for some time and you've matured in the faith, perhaps you forgot what it was like to be that immature, younger believer who's alone. And today, Jesus would call you up. And he would say, find, find someone that you can walk with that you can disciple in the ways of Jesus, that you can encourage and hold them accountable and lead them to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. As people are praying all across this place, I wonder if there's one here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus. And today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day that changes everything. If that's you, as people are praying all across this place, people are, are praying. Lord, what is my response? The Lord's given you your response. You're praying, give me the strength, the courage, the knowledge. Maybe there's one here, whether in the house or online, and you don't know where you would spend eternity if you were to die today. But the scripture says you can have eternal life through Jesus, through Jesus. So today, would you accept the greatest gift that Jesus walked this earth, that he died on a cross, that he was placed in a grave, and he rose victorious. Would you accept the greatest gift? Jesus, your boss, your Lord of my life, your master from this day forward, I, I surrender and I'll follow you all the days of my life. Maybe there's some that need to recommit to following him. You've gone through all some different paths, and today the Lord would speak to your heart, your life, say, follow my path. Follow my path. Live for me, for my glory. So Lord Jesus, thank you for this church. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for the living hope. Thank you for heaven. God, I pray that we would Never stop being desperate for you. We would realize that we are lost without you. We need you. We need you. Every moment of every day, we need you. So Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We commit to following you. We ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus as we continue to worship now through giving of tithes and offerings. We pray this. Amen. Amen. Amen.